All right, let's go to Judges chapter 9. Judges 9. I'm really, really hoping we get raptured before we have to deal with Samson. <laughs> and if not before Samson, before chapter 17, it really gets very, very ugly after that. <clears throat> so, reminder of where we left off from a couple of weeks ago now, because Pastor Joe was up here last week. Uh, we were dealing with uh, Abimelech, uh, Gideon's, it's Gideon's son through a concubine. And uh, Abimelech had killed 69 of his half-brothers. Uh, only Jotham had escaped because uh, of the 70 sons. So uh, I want to remind you of the approach that I often take with Scripture, Pastor Joe takes with Scripture. Uh, proper Bible study would remind us that there are a number of applications to Scripture. Of course, there's prophetic. We usually don't reference that, but there's a historical application. Something literally happened at the time that God said it happened. There's a doctrinal application. What is God trying to teach us and by and large, in the Old Testament, the doctrinal application of the, old, of the old, it's a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So we look for the types of Christ in the Old Testament that gives us the doctrinal application. Um, and if it's not Christ, sometimes it'll deal with the nation of Israel or deal with Antichrist. Then there's the spiritual application. Well, what does that mean for me? What do I draw out of that inspirationally in my life and how to live? So as we look at what's going to happen here today, we've got some deeper waters to tread. And Jotham, he makes his way back to Shechem, uh, the city, to deliver a uh, parable to the people that had made this wicked Abimelech their king. So he's going to present them with this parable. And there is a historical application which we'll actually cover, Lord willing, next week. Um, today we're going to deal with the doctrinal and the spiritual applications of these trees. He lays out this parable and begins talking about trees. And it could mean nothing, it could mean something. I think it means something or God wouldn't have penned it. Right? So, this is, we've got a lot to cover. Father, help us to see everything that we need to see. Help be with my mouth, Lord. Be with my mind. Keep me focused and um, able to deliver the Word of God properly, Lord. I don't know. This is a difficult portion of Scripture. I don't, I'm not confident that I've got everything correct here, Lord. Um, but what I do have correct, I pray that you would impress upon the hearts of the people. And either way, receive glory through um, our time studying out your Word tonight. We pray and ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get to verse 7 of the text. Here's the, well, this is the verse before the parable. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, lifted up his voice and cried, and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. And we'll just stop right there for the moment. It's interesting that uh, Jotham would choose this Mount Gerizim to deliver a parable. Have you ever heard of Gerizim before? There's two mountains um, that are referenced to cursing and blessing. It's Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Uh, here, let me, let me show you. It's Deuteronomy 11. Keep your place here. Deuteronomy 11. I'll give you the text. I mean, there's so many things, right? I mean, the Bible's so big, right? And when you go to Israel, they, when it's dealing with the nation of Israel, they just throw out these rivers. You're like, oh, yeah, right? Places of mountains, cities, names of people. Oh, it happened when that earthquake happened. Oh, well, they all knew about the earthquake. I don't know what earthquake are you talking about. The Lord just throws that stuff out there, and you kind of got to do a little bit of historical background and checking. And oftentimes, and most of the time, there, the information's in the Bible. You just got to find out a little bit, do a little bit of research. So Deuteronomy 11.29, 29. 
And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon, upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Now, I'm not bringing you here to go through the whole litany of what's going on here in Deuteronomy 11, um, but also to remind you, or to, uh, to tell you, Deuteronomy 27, verse 12 says that these shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over Jordan. So there's a place that they would stand to pronounce a curse upon the people, and there's a place that they would stand to pronounce a blessing. And Gerizim is the place of blessing. So it's interesting because Jotham is about to use it as a place to curse. So he's switching this thing around. Um, Jotham says, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. So here's the picture. Jotham stands upon this mount of blessing, offering God's goodness unto the people and space for repentance. Here's, you don't have to have King Abimelech. I'm letting you know it was a bad choice, right? We're giving you, we're giving you space here. Um, now, he's going to go on to use words and pictures that are likely going to offend people. That's why he preaches this little parable here. Much like preachers are called to do. Mm -hmm. yep. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the, uh, the commandment given to every pastor. Yep. That's not a suggestion. It's not God says, hey, this would be a good idea. No, it's a command. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That makes it two thirds negative. Yep. No one likes to be reproved or rebuked. We all like exhortation. Yay! Good job. Get it right. You know, here's how to do it good. Here's me. Go get them. Jesus saves. Yay! Right? But reproving and rebuking, um, reproving, you got it wrong. Yeah. Rebuking, shame on you for getting it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it takes it even a step further. By rejecting the counsel of the prophet of God, they reject the blessing. That's what a lot of church people don't get. And I, and I get the fact that there's so many errant pastors. And I've been one of them myself. I've, I've erred in the scriptures. I've erred in judgment. I've erred in character. But there's guys that make a living off of this. <laughs> and they know they're doing it. And it's cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So I get that there's, there is a distrust for pastors. Many pastors have been hurt. Many pastors have a distrust for the people. But the reality is, is God gave some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the Amalek and blah, blah, blah. But that's the place of blessing. Pulpit's a place of blessing. The street corner where we preach the gospel. It's a place of blessing. Amen. But if you reject it, it turns to the curse. That's right. God's going to listen. Every person that drives by Walden and Union with a middle finger, if you don't think God's not going to replay that for them, right. well, I didn't hear that. You heard it from these 20 people that you called idiots and some other things. Yep. You heard it. So, like I said, it's just a valley away, right? Choose the blessing. So let's now move on to the parable that Jotham shares. Verses 8 and 9. Ready? The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go and be promoted over the trees. So now this is an interesting thing. You know, you can go back to when Jesus heals the blind man and he lays his fingers on him and he says, what do you see? And I see men as trees walking. Uh, men are often likened unto trees and plants. They're likened unto vineyards and harvests. Just that talk. Yeah. And have attitude. <laughs> so... We've got three trees that are mentioned in this parable uh, and some bramble that will be mentioned, and Lord willing, we'll get to that next week. 
Uh, but the first of the th uh, three trees here, verses 8 and 9, is the olive tree. And it's going to, of course, like I mentioned in our opening, it's going to be up to us to uh, consider what the representation of each of these trees is, doctrinally, spiritually, and historically. Historically, we'll do next week. Uh, so we're going to deal with the doctrinal and the spiritual applications. What we have here is the olive tree. It is likely, though no one can prove it, it's probably pretty solid, the tree of life. You have the word live in it. So God doesn't write on accident. In fact, it's, oh, live. Why will ye die, O Israel? Oh, live. So, doctrinally, who's the life giver? Let's go to John 6, verse 35. God does these things um, in the English language that you actually can't get from all the Hebrew and Greek lovers out there. Um, this, this is amazing stuff when he does just little words that have inside, if you break them down. Go on your own time sometime. Um, we haven't done uh, the book of Esther. But if, you know what, let me show you because it's just funny. Let's go to Esther. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. I always have to remind myself. Where is that now? Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. I just get a kick out of this. I never heard anyone preach out of it, I, and I could not miss it. I'm like, look at this. <laughs> it's a little out of order. But if you have eyes to see, so you know the Esther chapter 1. You've got this king, and he's parading his wife around, right? And he's got all the kings there, and it turns into a big old drunken flesh fest, right? And in verse 10, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and uh, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king. And I thought, boy, look at that. that the guy's name's Carcass. Yeah. And I'm thinking, this is a big old flesh fest. And then now look at this. Human is in Mehuman. Big. And I thought, big human carcass. Yeah. Right in the text. And this is from their names. You just have to extrapolate it from their names. And that's exactly what you're seeing on display. The flesh. Big human carcass. God does stuff like that in the scripture. And you just got to have eyes. You just got to look. Just look. God, please speak to me. Well, you know what? When you, when you read the Bible, it, it doesn't hurt to ask for help. <laughs> I don't, and I'm, I'm the same way. I can be where I'm just like, okay, well, this is, these are the verses today. Check, right? Yeah. But how many times do I do check, 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 and not get anything? Or just go, Lord, help me. And then, boom, look at this. I don't even care what I checked off. That means nothing. Amen. Right? So that I got something out of it. That's a, so just open our eyes, right? John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of what? He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So what's the point? I should probably back up a little bit. What is being, what had been offered to Gideon and his sons was the right to rule. And Gideon says, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. I've got a different calling in my life. I'm not interested in that. And his sons are not interested in that. And so that's the perspective that we need to look at it both doctrinally and spiritually. And we can draw some great spiritual application, which hopefully we'll do tonight. But the trees want the olive tree. 
That's the parable. All the, pe the average trees go, oh, olive tree, rule over us. And the olive tree represents doctrinally Jesus Christ. Rule over us, of course. You say, you say, but wait a minute, the people don't want him. The people did want him. This is a type of Jesus. The olive tree is a type of Jesus at his first coming. That he was miracle producing. He raised people from the dead. Yeah. He gave them food. Better than the United States government can steal taxes from people and give them cheese. He gave them like a fish meal and bread. Now, I don't like fish. Maybe he would have made me a grilled cheese sandwich or a cheeseburger or something. I don't know. Some buffalo chicken wings. <laughs> but he feeds the poor. He heals the sick. He gives the common people, he gives the trees what they need and lots of times even what they wanted. Fullness of belly and soundness of body. And before we accuse them for wanting those things, don't you? Just go a few meals without eating. Your stomach will tell you you're hungry. And just go a little time without a sound body. It messes with you not just physically, brother, my, my wife. Yes. Emotionally, spiritually, it affects you. So even the disciples were more interested in the kingdom of heaven, which is the physical kingdom, and particularly their position within that kingdom, than they were the kingdom of God, which cannot be seen with the naked eye, right? You must be born again to see that kingdom. So doctrinally, Jesus is the olive tree at his first coming, rejecting the office of king. He was not king at his first coming. I am not here to reign over you. I'm here to save you. Oh, live. Amen. And he offers everlasting life to the people. So, now, spiritually, practical application for us. Let's go to Hosea 14. Let's get a different look at... Uh, the olive tree. Just to give you one of a bunch, we'd be here all night. Honestly, this is such a deep parable. That's why I say I don't even know that I'm getting all this because I, I just know, I don't want to say this. There's some, ver uh, some sections of scripture where I'll be like, okay, I, I, I got a lot of that. I think I get a lot of that. And here we go, boom, 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 we're here for a while. But I just, I walk away very unsatisfied with this, like I'm not teaching this properly. So, maybe it's just a personal thing. Hosea 14, look at verse 6. His branches shall spread, his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. Who's, what's, where, why, uh, that doesn't matter. The point being, the olive tree is beautiful. It is represented as godly in Psalm 52 and verse 8. It is referenced as fair in Jeremiah 11 and 16. And again, beautiful here in Hosea. Now turn to Isaiah 52. Are you born again? Amen. Then you have who in you? Jesus. You have Christ's spirit in you. You have, church, you have life not only in you, but you offer it. Amen. Jesus offered life to us, we received it, and now you do what? I take that gospel that he offered himself, and I now bring that same life. I am the moon. Amen. I'm not the sun, I have no light of myself, but I reflect the light of the sun, and therefore still give light of the sun to the people of the planet. Amen. So that's my job, right? Isaiah 52 and verse 7. And what a beautiful job it is. Oh, live, right? The olive tree is beautiful. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Let me stand from Gerizim Amen. and offer you blessing that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. That saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. So spiritually, you're dealing with a godly and beautiful tree, a saved person who's spreading the message of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ. In particular, like Gideon's character represents, 
maybe a pastor, the leader of a local watch, church or assembly, a missionary, an evangelist, any one of us, this olive tree must, now back to the text, must leave his or her fatness in order to become king and therefore chooses not to do so. Again, what is this, what is this offer to Gideon's sons? It is an offer to co-mingle with the inhabitants of the earth and to start to play in their political games. Rule over us. Gideon's like, I don't want to. Right? Samuel, you're getting old. Go find us a king. You, don't, you guys don't want a king. You want the Lord, right? No, we want a king. This is a regular problem for Israel. You got to leave your fatness. If we, if, we, if we give up, put it this way. Here I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would I give that up for a different vocation? Well, you make more money. Great. More money that, what, I can bring to heaven with me? I believe I need to save for retirement. In case I get old and I stand up here and I'm just behind you. And you guys are like, man, we got to get rid of this guy. He's not even making sense at this point. <laughs> Sometimes it might be now. I don't know. But by and large, money, what? For what? For what? For what? I have what do we need? The bills are paid? Yeah. Uh, how much is enough? Right. Why don't, where's my heart? Come on, oh, that's it. This position is too high to give up, right. yes. spiritually speaking. In Hebrews 11.40, it says that God provided some better thing for us, right? This, this, the better book of Hebrews. We have a better testament. We have a better priest. We have better salvation. We have a better kingdom. Amen. Right? We got the spiritual kingdom. We, don't, we got the kingdom of God. We don't have the kingdom of heaven. We don't have to worry about that. We got a better world. I got a spiritual world. I don't need this physical world. I got a higher calling. Amen. He provided something better for us. What did he provide? Well, now are we free? There's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. We sing that song. This is why I, I'm not really for a pastor, in particular a pastor, missionary, or evangelist, giving up their position in order to run for political office. Yeah. Say, well, they do that and sometimes successfully. I know. I'm, I, think, I think it was a demotion. Yeah, yeah they're going to make a lot more money. Politicians aren't supposed to, but they do. <laughs> you know, I think of Mike Huckabee. Oh, we all love Mike Huckabee. He was, you know, he was a former Baptist pastor. I said, yeah, why did he quit? That's right. Well, he's in politics now. He's, he's helping us out. He's conservative. We've got lots of conservatives that didn't used to preach the gospel. Right. Now we got one less person preaching the gospel. Right. He, he left his fatness. The pulpit is the place of blessing. It is garrison. So there's, there's too much potential to get occupied by a different fight. I personally, and I'm into politics. You guys know me. I, I keep up on things. Um, but I don't feel the need to go fix American politics by entering into the political realm. I will preach against the sins of all of the politicians because I'm a preacher of righteousness. It's my job. So thank God that the olive tree here said, thank you, but no thank you. I'm walking in God's salvation as I ought, which is better than walking in the provision of the people as me over them as king. It's a higher position. That's why, get this now, that's why God says in Daniel 4.17, that over these physical kingdoms, he sets the basest of men. 
Daniel 4.17. You can look at it on your own sometime. What does base mean? Lowest. It is the lowest of men. That's who he sets over the kingdom. <laughs> you think about that. Oh, not financially. Oh, they're the elite. They're the super rich. They're the notable. They're the great men of the earth. In God's mind, they're spiritually, morally bankrupt. Yeah, let's put that guy in. Let's put that guy in charge. They're the basest of men. Therefore, overseeing God's people, in my estimation, and I believe in God's estimation, it's more important than overseeing my fellow countrymen. <laughs> my countrymen, lend me your ears. Church, lend me your ears. This, I think it's just a better calling. Truly believe it. Okay, next, next tree. Verses 10 and 11. And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go be promoted over the trees? So the second tree that shows up in this parable is the fig tree. Doctrinal application can be found in the law of first mention. Let's all the way back to the book of Genesis, back to the garden. Genesis 3, look at verses 6 and 7. Now, do you, anyone here that's done any kind of typology in the scripture, typically when you think the fig tree, who do you think that represents? Israel. Nation of Israel. And it's right. But why? Of all the trees that God could have used to represent Israel, why the fig? I'll show you why. Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, we're now talking about, right, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they took the leaves of the fruit-bearing tree. And what did they try to do here? Cover their sins without God's intervention. I'm going to hide from God and I'm going to cover myself. This is a tree of self-righteous good works. It depicts Israel as a nation quite well because they sought salvation, quote from Romans 9.32, not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. They rejected the rule of God over them in favor for foreign protection over and over and over again throughout their history. They got what they wanted. They still have it. They just didn't know that what they wanted would be so destructive. And it has been. This is why Jesus cursed the fig tree. It was supposed to produce fruit. He came at the time. What did he see on the tree? Leaves and no fruit. Self-righteousness produces no fruit. That's the text. She became a spiritual wasteland, which, by the way, the church isn't much different in these last days, which brings us to the spiritual application of the fig tree because the church is a spiritual type of Israel. She, too, will have a connection to the fig tree, but in a different manner of speaking. Let's go to 1 Kings, get a little idea, different idea of what this tree is supposed to afford us. Should she be producing fruit and bearing leaves, then she should be, some, for, should be something of good, right? 1 yeah. Kings 4.25, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, safely, every man under his vine and under his 
Fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba all the days of Solomon. Proverbs 27, 18 says, Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof, so he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. The fig tree represents safety and comfort. But whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat of the fruit thereof. It takes work to maintain it. But should you maintain it, then you can eat of it. Okay, this spiritually represents the safety and comfort of the assembly, the church. You should be able to come here for comfort and safety and partake of the fruit. Gathering around the sweetness of the word and counsel of God. How sweet are thy words to the, my taste, yea, sweeter uh, than uh, honey to my mouth, is what uh, Psalm 119, 103 says. Amen. It's a place where Christians can rest in the, the comfort and fellowship of one another, fellowship of the saints. But a place that must, must be spiritually maintained for it to continue to bear edible fruit so that it doesn't turn into a place that just has a big pile of self-righteous leaves, but no fruit produced by the Holy Spirit of God. Should the fig tree desire to be king? In other words, should the church seek prominence in the community? She's going to find herself like Israel. Self-righteous, self-sufficient, and cursed. She's going to have to compromise her spiritual self in order to climb into the adulterous bed of the political arena. I know pastors in this community that are all, they're all about Community, 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 community. Like, where's the gospel? You guys realize that the same word, the word that you use over and over and over again, the root word of that is commune. It's communism. That's the root of the word. You're not called to fix your community through political action. You're called to preach the gospel to them. If the community gets cleaned up and you've swept every street and every single soul on that street goes to hell, that's the preacher's fault for sweeping instead of preaching. Churches have been doing this for years. I wrote a chapter on it in one of my books, The Babylon Effect. The title of that chapter, which got me in a lot of hot water, is Merchandising Jesus and Prostituting the Church. It's not for the faint of heart. (laughs) Judges 9, look at verses 12 and 13. Let's move on. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? So the third one is the vine tree. See, is it a tree? It's a tree. God called it a tree. See, but it lays on the ground. I don't care what man calls what. Man labels things the way he wants to. I go with God's assessment. So doctrinally, this again will point back to Jesus. Shouldn't it? Yeah, we'll go to John 15. Look at verse 1. We know it, but, you know, let's look at it. But it's going to be a little different manner than the first time we looked at Christ through the olive tree. You guys are always going to call it the olive tree now. <laughs> John 15, 1. I am the true vine. See, he's not Israel. That was, that was a spreading vine, right? It's a corrupt vine. He's the true vine. My father is the husbandman. So if there's a true vine, there's also a false vine. 
And we'll get to him, Lord willing, next week. That's, that's the man of sin. Um, but let's go to Ezekiel 15 here. This is an interesting verse. How many here like to have fires? Maybe sit around a little campfire? Would you use the vine for kindling? He does here. Ezekiel 15, verse 6. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. <laughs> for what? To be burned up. So, we won't go into the full portion of the text. What's the purpose of the vine here in its context? For fuel, to keep the fires of God's wrath ablaze. Now watch this. Go to uh, Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 49. Jesus says, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? I mean, you get that, right? You say, I am going to light this thing up and what do you want me to do if you've already put all the wood in place? Yeah. He's like, you guys did that. You're the kindling. Yeah. You've set yourself in that place. Yeah. So in regards to the doctrinal application of the vine tree here, we're dealing with Jesus Christ at his second coming. Yep. The trees have been gathered, the wheat or the fruitful into his barn and the rest as chaff or bramble to be burned. It's kindling. Jesus is going to set the fire. It'll, be, it'll keep blazing. Question is, how will Jesus say, I will not reign over you? Because remember, let's go back to what this parable is about. It's about rejecting, I don't want to reign over you. Right? So how is it that Jesus at his second coming can rightly say, I will not reign over you, now that he is ready to rule and reign with a rod of iron? The key is found in that he did not say, I will not reign. I will not reign over you. You who? All right. You who? You who? I've never had it. But let's go to Matthew chapter 25. I've never seriously had a you who. Not once in my life. I don't know why I'm talking like this, but here. <laughs> Matthew 25. You who? Here's who. Look at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. So everyone's going to come before him. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Skip down to verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hungered, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. The least of these, in context, the tribulation saints. It's following Matthew chapter 24, dealing with the great tribulation. There will be nations who will mistreat the Jews. Those are going on the left. They're the goat nations. 
Then there will be those on the right that did take care of the Jews or at least did not persecute them. They will be allowed to enter into the millennial reign. What's he going to do with the rest? Verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You get other portions of text, he's going to burn them up. Yep. What are they? They're the vine for fuel. He said, depart from me. See, at this point, the trees are going to be, come on, when Jesus returns back, listen, just imagine if you're Cuomo's and you're de Blasio's, and think of every other disgusting politician you can think of in your head. Those are the first two that pop into mind. <laughs> yeah. I, I try not to think about it. Um, <laughs> If they survived the tribulation, right down to the return of Jesus Christ, and he says, okay, all the leaders of the nations, Valley of Jehoshaphat, right now. Here they come. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, oh we, we knew you'd be coming, oh we love you, you're the best, you're the best, we couldn't wait for you to return. You, know, you just know they're going to do what they do now right. lie through their teeth. I'm not going to reign over you. You're the bramble. Depart from me. Come on. Here I am. I'm just going to... There's fire coming out my eyes. Read about that in Revelation. Now, spiritually, spiritual application is found in what the vine tree will have to abandon in order to rule over the trees. Again, looking for a personal application, what will happen if I choose as a human being, as a person, as a Christian, if I choose prominence in the world over God's will for my life? I must give up my wine. Represented here as joy and cheerfulness, not drunkenness. Don't pervert the truth. But consider Ecclesiastes 10.19, a feast is made for laughter and wine maketh merry. But money answereth all things. <laughs> That's a world, by the way. That is Solomon at his worst, writing this and God's allowing it to be said. Money answereth all things. Do you know the modern equivalent to that? Money talks. That's where they get it. You wonder where so many of the sayings come from? I could have completed the tail end of that, but there's children present. And in Judges, wine cheers the heart. So the spiritual picture here is that a Christian will have to leave his joy in order to seek prominence out in that wicked world. And for any one of you, and myself included, because I have been one of those Christians that walked out in the world for a spell. It's miserable. I had to give up my cheer. There was no merriment in it. I draw cheer and joy and merriment from spending time with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Okay, let's conclude. Next week we'll come back to the text. We're going to, again, we're going to examine it historically because Jotham is the son of Gideon. We can't erase the historical point. He's telling these people a story for a reason and there's a historical reason. So we'll get to that. And then we'll take a look at the bramble and we'll see what that represents. But I think we've had enough to digest for one night. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing that is the Word of God. Just filled, filled, filled. I don't know that I saw what I needed to see in here, Lord. I don't know if I did the text justice, but... The people seem merry, at least at the fellowship. So uh, I give you praise for that, Lord. Whatever it is, 
that uh, your spirit can impress upon the people through tonight's message. I pray that, Holy Spirit of God, that you would do that for your glory and honor. And um, uh, get my brothers and sisters home safely. And uh, we love you. And just thank you for salvation, Lord Jesus. We pray.